This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I'm so excited because I will be talking to the lovely Suzanne Cryer. Oh my god, you know her from so many great TV shows. Most recently, you know her from Silicon Valley. But back in the 90s, early 2000s, she was on Two Girl, uh, two Guys, A Girl, and a Pizza Place on ABC. And she was so damn funny on that show. And of course, everybody knows her as the Yada Yada Girl on Seinfeld. But uh, she was also in one of the most criminally underrated indie films of all time, Friends and Lovers, celebrating its 25th anniversary. She was also in Wag the Dog, with De Niro and Hoffman, directed by Barry Levinson. Uh, she guest starred on Caroline in the City. Um, she was on an episode of Life Stories, Families in Crisis on HBO, The King of Queens. Lots of great work, and we're going to talk today. I can't wait. This is almost two years in the making. She did the uh, Seinfeld podcast. This podcast is making me thirsty. And I started tweeting at her and she resisted for a long time. But then we started following each other on Instagram. And then I was able to send a DM. And after much more convincing, she finally said yes. And I am so excited for today. She is awesome. She is such a funny lady and a talented actress. And once again, I cannot wait. She didn't do anything in the horror genre, but it's okay. We are going to talk about, you know, comedy roles today. So yeah, here is my interview with Suzanne Cryer. Hey, Suzanne, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Nice to be here. It's sunny and no more rain in Los Angeles, so I'm very happy. Uh, we got overcast weather over here in Modesto, so I'm so jealous right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's helping all the fruit trees in our backyard, because some of them are looking a little sad. So. Nice, nice. The rain, the rain is really a good thing. I can't complain, but it was definitely, it was, it, it was a lot. Oh, yes, the earth needs a cleansing for sure. <laughs> Exactly, in so many ways. <laughs> yes. I can't tell you what a great honor this is. Thank you so much for finally coming on today. This is awesome. No, it's great. I, 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 I love your sort of uh, blast from the past kind of. It, it's, very, it's very cool to talk about um, uh, things that we've done in the history of and some shows that are forgotten, some shows that are not forgotten at all. You know, Seinfeld never, never dies, but I don't think anyone's talking about Dave's world anymore. <laughs> yeah. That was my first draft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Yeah, I started off doing musical theater, as I think a lot of kids do, and I'm um, really a fairly mediocre singer. In this day and age, there are so many great singers, but I don't, maybe people weren't as discriminating back when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, I would do a lot of, like, community musical theater. And then I got my uh, equity card doing Annie Get Your Gun at a dinner theater outside of New York. But um, I had always wanted to do comedy, and so I think musical theater was a way into that. Mm -hmm. And um, and I always had wanted to do sitcoms specifically. I had a very a very um, targeted approach of what I wanted to do. I really saw sitcoms and thought that is something that I want to do. It looks fun. It just looks joyful. And I used to feel that the the crossover between sort of musical theater style of comedy acting and sitcom worked really well. If you could meter it, I mean, you obviously have to be a little bit smaller on sitcoms. That's changed over the years. We've really seen um, our comedies get closer to hour longs in many ways. Uh, in many ways. So, so I think that's really changed. But the crossover was easy for me early on. So I, I started off doing a lot of sitcoms. Absolutely. So you're born in New York, raised in Connecticut? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, and and lived there all my life, and went to school there, and stayed in school there through through graduate school. So I was very much uh, a an East Coast kid, 
and then came out to California after grad school, after I did regional theater around, um, because I went to Yale Drama School, did a bunch of regional theater around there, and then came out to do a play, actually. The reason I came to California wasn't to do television, but it was to do a play. And, um, but it was an incredible, incredible play written by Donald Margulies that was being premiered down at South Coast Repertory Theater, which did a lot of um, new work. And they were doing really exciting um, play development back um, in the late 90s and up to the 90s. And, and uh, so it was a two-hander that then went on to Broadway or off-Broadway, I guess it went to Playwrights Horizons, starring uh, Deb Messing, who I've known for years and years and years. But oh, yeah. at that point, I was already going to go to Neil Simon play on Broadway, so I was not, um, I had already been tied up for that, so when Collected Stories was going, they were looking for a great cast, and they cast that messing, so it was, it's, a, it's one of those small world things, and um, and it was really a, a wonderful experience get, getting to do those plays early in my career, and then after that, I basically settled into TV, and I haven't really done a lot of theater since then, just because I'm a mom, too, so yeah, I'm really well. My, it works with my schedule really well. Yeah, and uh, you you did a um, a summer of performing at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. How was that experience? You know that that actually was one of the great experiences of my life. I mean, the the the, the folks in in Utah, predominantly Mormons, um, who created this theater, they they have this enormous love of, of Shakespeare and theater, mm-hmm. and the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Not only is it a great home to be able to do repertory theater, so I'd be doing As You Like It one night and Richard the Third the next night, um, but it's in the most beautiful location in the world. So when you have time off, you could go to Zion and hike. And um, it was I did that one summer during during graduate school while I was at Yale. They would come and audition, and I was lucky enough to be someone that they cast. And so. Um, I went off and got these incredible parts as a, a pretty young kid in grad school yeah. um, because I was playing Rosalind and As You Like It. And it was really an extraordinary experience. And, um, you know, I'm forever thankful to that. Uh, and uh, I also, it's funny because I went off rather curvy to Utah, <laughs> but I did so much hiking and I was working so hard, even though I spent a lot of the summer eating Taco Bell, I came home very skinny <laughs> and sort of ready to graduate and go into New York and do uh, and do uh, a television. Because at that point, people still really, I think, cared about being uh, on the slim side. Now that's really changed and I just don't think it's necessary in it anymore. But back in the 90s, people still did. Yeah. Care. They're, they're, they're ladies on TV to um, be a size, you know, too. That is just, that's one nice thing that that has changed. The pressure on that, there's there's a lot of diversity of looks, and that's just, that's gone by the way, wayside. Do, do you understand Shakespeare well? I do. I mean, I think, um, I think I've always been fundamentally an academic at heart. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my first year when I was got out of undergraduate, I actually was a school teacher. Um, it's something I've always thought about doing, and it's something I always thought that I might do. And I often think about it now. I I, I spend more of my time uh, doing advocacy work in the public school system in Los Angeles, on oh. with administrators and the district, and and working on various issues. I would then I do acting. Even when I'm away filming, I'm still doing advocacy work. And and, um, back when my children were slightly younger, I was in the classroom all the time, directing plays, doing poetry supplementations, even teaching science, helping out, because our public school system is perpetually underfunded here in Los Angeles. Um, It is across the country, but we have a particular set of um, constraints given, uh, not to get too into the weeds, but because of Prop 13, which capped which capped property taxes, and it made it very hard to do education funding. So our, our poor teachers um, who are doing the most important work in, in the country today, because without a, without a, an educated uh, populace, we can't really have a democracy, right? Right. Um, they're, they're, they're always needing uh, financial or even just 
personnel assistance just to get through their days and teach all the subjects they're expected to teach on top of making sure kids are safe and clothed and fed because, of course, Los Angeles Unified is at its heart a social service safety net. Anyway, so I, I, when you ask about Shakespeare, I guess that's a long answer to a short question. I, I, I think I've always thought of myself as a reader and a thinker, and um, and um, Shakespeare's a happy place for me. I, I think it combines those two things, and when you can make it really um, accessible by understanding yourself, you watch people like Liev Schreiber is someone who's extraordinarily good at Shakespeare. He, yeah. he went to Yale Drama School. He graduated just a couple of years ahead of me and, and, you know, was an old friend. He he has a way of taking even the densest Shakespeare and making it very, very accessible to audiences. He's a remarkable Shakespeare actor. So is Paul Giamatti. And so are many, many people that I went to school with. Um, and uh, I think that's the fun of it is sort of unlocking it and then making it seem easy to the listener. Yeah, because yeah, I, I have found there's a lot of actors that don't uh, understand Shakespeare, but they do they do it on stage anyway, even though they don't know why they're saying, you know, what life beyond your window breaks or, you know, to sleep no more. <laughs> you know, they don't know what that right. means. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's hard to do it if you if you don't have a director or a dramaturg to kind of guide you through that, I think it's, it's I'm not saying it's impossible to, to act something without understanding it, but boy, I, I think it would be tricky. I would think that, that that lack of understanding would translate to the audience. I think the best Shakespeare productions tend to be when you have a group, an ensemble that really clearly understands what they're saying. And, right. um, and, mm-hmm. and sometimes you have to make some judicious cuts because some things just don't translate to a modern audience anymore. They're, you know, they have like arcane syphilis jokes that just no one's going to get. They don't, they <laughs> although I guess syphilis is making a comeback, but, uh, but, but in general, some of those old fashioned hearty, har, har Shakespeare syphilis jokes just don't translate. No one knows what the heck you're talking about in Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, and also too, you know, it's just as Victorian as Sigmund Freud's theories on sex. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly, just exactly, exactly, old, old century. Yeah. So um, the first film cred on your IMDb is called Vaudeville. Is that was that like a college movie or something? Well, you know, if that is actually, it's interesting that you mentioned that movie because the, the fellow who directed, wrote and directed that movie, it was, it was done right after I graduated college with an extraordinary group of people, actually. One of them is my dearest friend in the world, Patrick Kerr, who um, is on the Big Door Prize, and um, a lot of people know him as Noel from Frasier. Mm-hmm. But that movie was directed by a fellow named Ira Sachs. He's a gay filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a movie about like the last vaudeville troupe in America, like during the eighties, yeah. and they kind of go around doing these bizarre. I mean, it's just it's just this bizarre little short film. But Iris Sachs, his career is, you know, he's very much stayed in his lane of doing these kind of artistic, intellectual movies that tackle a lot of gay subjects. He's huge right now. Yeah. His movie this year, many people think it was one of the. the I've read these reviews. They're calling it one of the best movies of the year. You're not seeing him on the Academy Award um, nominees, but we all know that those nominees tend to relate to a lot of other things outside of what is, you know, it's a, it's a complicated uh, cocktail of reasons that you get nominated for things. But Ira Ira Sack is is. He, he wasn't just a college filmmaker. He went on to be a really, really important filmmaker and mm-hmm. widely respected. And I did one other movie um, in, in college, um, but that was actually during college. We filmed it on campus at Yale. This is undergraduate. This is not grad student. And it was with a fellow named George Hickenlooper, who died, unfortunately. But George went on to be a huge, huge filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, and most widely known for Hearts of Darkness, um, which uh, kind of was a behind the scenes, uh, you know, look at at, at um, the filming of um, um, the filming of uh, 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 Apocalypse Now. Oh, okay. So, yeah. In any case, um, but George, yeah. So, so it's so funny that these two little movies that I did in college actually are with, you know, in. People who went on to become serious filmmakers, famous 
you know, respected filmmakers, um, really smart guys. But these initial movies, I mean, Vaudeville, I, I, I probably have it on tape somewhere, but I don't know that anyone could even see it. Um, I played a gay girl in it who was, you know, drank a lot of martinis and, <laughs> um, and, uh, and very, I was very curvy back then. Um, and, uh, looked very different than I did when I got out of grad school. I was just, a, that was a young thing. I was like 20 years old or something. So mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah. Is that where you got your SAG card? Oh no, gosh, that was like, I don't think anybody was union in it. It was some non-union. It was, it was just, no, I think I got my SAG card doing law and order with, um, and I had gotten that uh, audition from a friend of mine, Chris Note, who okay. I've known for a, a bajillion years, um, because he had been a grad student at Yale when I was an undergraduate, and I got to know him then. And I remember when he got cast in Law and Order before it even was on the air. And um, I remember being in my friend's apartment. We were we were pretty close friends with Chris, and he called us and he said, "Hey, uh, I just got a, a television show. It's, it's called Law and Order." and uh, going to be a really big deal and we were like yeah 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 and he's like no it's, it's really he knew he knew when he got cast in this show that it was going to be i mean i don't think anyone could have predicted how big it was going to be but yeah. he knew chris was a smart guy and he really really recognized that this show was going to become something enormous which of course it did yep. um, pop culture phenomenon so 35 years later, I mean, it's just, it's, and it's still, it's the machine that powers television, so. Yeah. And my dear friend Cameron Mannheim now, you know, doing, doing, doing it in New York again, so it's just incredible, it's the, it's the, it's the gift that keeps giving to New York actors, because it's, Law & Order has given a lot of us our, our, uh, side cards. Yeah. Did, did you say you did a Dave's World? Yeah, I think that was my first, my first job when I came to uh, Los Angeles right after I, I was doing the play, the Donald Markley's play, um, my friend uh, Marco Panette mm-hmm. is he's probably one of my oldest friends in the world. I went to, um, I went to, to nursery school with Marco <laughs> and I was a fairly incompetent child and Marco used to help me get on the bus. My mother would say, please, Marco, make sure she gets on the right bus. I was an idiot. I couldn't tell. They all were yellow to me, and I couldn't tell which one to get on to go home. And Marco would say, Suzanne, get on this bus. You know, just in any case, Marco had become a huge, you know, television guy out in L.A. And, you know, people know Marco from Caroline in the City. He's done a bajillion shows since then. But um, he was on Dave's World, and um, I came out to do, uh, you know, I was doing theater here, and Marco had me audition for some waitress. Um, and so it was my, I think that was my first sitcom that I ever did was, was Dave's World. Yeah, for it was some, really fun. It was, really, yeah, it was fun getting to work with those guys. Yeah, for some reason it's not listed on your IMDb. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that before because I wouldn't have known. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's probably, I mean, it was so long ago. and um, But I do think that was my very first, and there might have been something else. It's so hard to remember. But that one, I remember that the guys, they, they they tried to have me, and I, I think in the final cut of it, I did end up saying, slap my ass and call me Rudy, because they had been trying to get that line in. They had been trying to get, for some reason, it was like, you know how actors have things that they, they've been doing the show for a while. They're like, we've been trying to get one of the guest stars to say, well, slap my ass and call me Rudy um, for years. Or <laughs> so, and so I think they found a way to have me say it. So they, they were pleased as punch that my character, this waitress, like then the last line, she goes, well, slap my ass and call me Rudy and walks away. Anyway, um, but, and I'm not sure it's in there. I don't even, I have no memory. And I don't even watch 90% of the stuff I do. I, swear, I, I, I film things and I don't usually watch them. Yeah, that sounds like they were trying to get an, another flow from Alice on that show yeah. with that catchphrase. Well, that was, it was literally like a five-line guest spot. It was like just some teeny. It was it was just it was such a gift to me, just like a little like, hey, here's a job on TV because it's hard to get a job on TV in Los Angeles unless you've had a job on TV. And the only thing I had ever done was years before doing this Law and Order, mm-hmm. um, which was very different. So once I got the Dave's World, then I was able to get other jobs like Seinfeld and things like that because they're like oh she she knows what to do on a sitcom set because a sitcom set is a very specific thing it's very mm-hmm. different than doing Law and Order 
Here's here's a dramatic role. I mean, I grew up on all the uh, HBO Life Stories, Families in Crisis movies, and I remember uh, someone had to be Benny because I think it was the last one, and ironically, it won three Emmys. What was that experience like? Well, you know, I mean, it's so funny. I realize, like, when I look back on these things now, like, I'll forget about them. But the guy who directed Someone Had to Be Benny is an enormous, important, incredible director. Mm -hmm. Incredible. It's Juan Campanella. And he is, I mean, he's a powerhouse. Um, But he's not as, he's not as widely known. He's not a household name to American uh, audiences. But Juan... One of my favorite people I've ever worked with, he was just this, um, um, he was this sort of unstoppable fountain of joy and good humor. But I was, that was one of my first jobs when I got out of Yale, drama school. And um, I was playing Benny's sister. And Asia, I think her name was Asia, was my my sister. She went on to do like four beautiful woman, incredible actress. But the hilarious thing is our mother was Donna Murphy. Yeah. Donna wasn't even a lot older than me. Donna was like maybe 10 years older than me. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Welcome to the world of Hollywood casting for women. But the funny thing about Donna Murphy is, so maybe she was pretending to play 40 at that time and wasn't yet. Yeah. I was pretending to play 20. She isn't. She's still playing forty. Donna Murphy's going to be playing forty. She has not age <laughs> that woman. She's so and she's so good and so nice. I was so blown away to be working with her because also she's such a triple threat. You know, I mean, she can do everything. But that you know that's funny because you do a lot of these. I mean, I have a lot of friends that have done a lot of junky things. Mm-hmm. Someone who had to, someone had to be Benny. It sounds like it's one of those junky things, but it actually sort of wasn't really a junky thing. And it had Donna Murphy and Juan Campanella. Like, I feel like I've been really lucky. I get these random jobs, but then the director goes on to be this really important, incredible um, director or whatever, you know? And, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I look back on that. And it's so funny. Yeah, Juan Campanella. He's, and Bill D'Elia, he directed the... Um, he directed the Law and Order I did back in the day, and he's just, yeah. he, he was kind of the Law and Order powerhouse guy. So I was very, very lucky um, to get to work with really terrific people. And, um, um, you know, you, you look back and you think, oh, wow, the show might have not been the greatest show or whatever, but I got to meet these people, which is, it's a real lesson to actors. Like, first of all, you never know who from something is going to, kind of go on to, like, write something incredible or do something incredible. It could be the PA, it could be the assistant, it could be the director, you know, so you should always, even if it's just for self-serving reasons, you should treat everybody nicely, but aside from that, I mean, you should just treat everybody nicely on set because we're so blessed when we're working. Oh, yeah. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, um, it really is true, though, the person who's the coffee runner assistant in a writer's room I guarantee you in three years is going to be running a show it's always true so um, so it's it's, uh, it's wise to, to treat everybody with respect and remember that you may not be working and they might be um, yeah when we talk about, when we talk about uh, being lucky I think when I did and I might have this wrong but I did some other show that like I, nobody even watched it. No one even knows it. I think it was called like New York News or something like that. Um, and I think Mary Tyler Moore was on it. Mm-hmm. But Michael Apted directed it. Yeah. I, I mean, so I was like doing like you know some like crying wife or something or whatever the heck it was. Mm-hmm. But I'm being directed by Michael Bloody Apted, you yeah. know. And you're like, wow, he just happens to be doing like a couple episodes of TV. And he directed the Cold Miner's Daughter. Yeah, no, I mean, Michael Apted was, jeez Louise, I was so lucky to get out of drama school and get to work with people like Juan Campanella and Michael Apted, and he's I mean, just, just luck, pure luck. So, uh, I love uh, I love the episode you did of Caroline in the City. That character was, was hilarious. Uh, oh, so that was another Marco job. So that yeah. was, 
so Marco, I think Marco Panette wasn't running Dave's World. His friends were. Mm-hmm. Um, I, if I remember, I, I really, it's so hard for me to remember, but I think Marco got me the audition for Dave's World through his friends. Um, and uh, and then he cast me, you know, he brought me in, and, and I, you know, with the, produce, the other people, but, you know, and then that was Marco's show. Mark, you know. That, and that was so much fun to be with all of them. And they gave me a, um, a mug at the end. It was such a nice thing to do. They produced on, on um, oh no, that was Dave's World. Dave's World made mugs that they would give to people who did guest spots. And the mug said, I got my mug on Dave's World, which I was always just the cutest thing in the world. It was like, what a nice thing, you know, like, I had that, I think I still have that mug. So cool. If I don't have it, it lived a very long time before I broke it. <laughs> but yeah, I, um, Carolina in the City was really fun. And I, you know, I'm still, I'm still friends with Amy Pete and see her all the time. Um, um, Leah Thompson, one of the sweetest ladies in the world. She was one of the first, like, she was like the first celebrity I met at a convention. And she was so sweet to me. She's the nicest person in the world, super smart, really well-rounded life. She does, she's done lots of cool things in her life between acting and midwivery. And I mean, she's just super cool, super nice. And, you know, Malcolm Guest was on that show. And I had known Malcolm mm-hmm. for years because he went to Yale Drama School. Um, a hilarious guy and a beautiful man, uh, really talented. Um, but anyway, yeah. Now, I, so, I, when I listened to um, your interview on the the Seinfeld uh, podcast, you you had a pretty uh, interesting story about how you got cast. You were doing a play, right? I I can't. Oh, I don't remember exactly what I was doing at the time. I I don't. I I maybe had just finished a play. Mm-hmm. I might have just finished doing the the Donald Margulies play, or I was doing. It was around that time. It's very confusing for me that time. It's hard to remember. But yeah, I just, you know, I just really wanted to be on Seinfeld. Uh, you were a huge oh, fan of the show? Yeah. Sorry, what? You were a huge fan of the show? Yeah, a huge fan of the show. And it just, you know, you thought to yourself, oh God, I've got to be on this show. It's seminal, you know. And um, it, 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 it's heartbreaking to be comedic actress or want to be one and then feel that you miss, you know, like, oh, boy, I never got to be on Cheers. I never got to be on Friends. You know, you think, oh, I just want to just be, you know, some quick patron in the bar even because you kind of think I want to be a part of the history. So it's fun to be a part of the history of Seinfeld. And um, and it's fun to be part of the history of Frasier. You know, just to have been part of it is really, really, it's an honor to um be part of. And the reality is, too, I mean, hour-long dramas can be nice to work on, but mm-hmm. it's not the same as working on a half hour. Half hours are really, really, really fun, unless you get really unlucky with some group of jerks. But I've never had that happen. I mean, in general, mm-hmm. working on a half half hour is just, it's, it's pure fun. Um, I mean, every day at work doing Two Guys and a Girl, it was fun. I mean, we, it was absolutely just like being in a playpen with a bunch of really funny people. And just, we just felt like we got to screw around and eat, you know, eat things at the snack bar. So it, it's really, you know, when you get to go to work and, and, and be with Ryan Reynolds or, or, or Kelsey Graham or, or you know, or um, Jerry Seinfeld and Julia louis Dreyfus and, and Jason Alexander, when you get to to work with people like that. Just, you're going to have a good day. I mean, yeah. if you don't have a good day and you're working with people that just make you laugh all day, then, then you're in the wrong job because how can you not have a good day? I mean, it's just fun. It's pure fun. So Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's one of my favorite episodes, you know. I mean, the whole episode is friggin' hilarious. Uh, not just, you know, with your character, but, you know, Brian Cranston converting to Judaism for the anti-Semitic uh, well, jokes. That's a great storyline. <laughs> I mean that's the real that's the storyline. That 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 is some of the best writing ever on the show. The the the, the anti dentite stuff is just yeah. <laughs> really, really really the converting to Judaism for the jokes and Jerry sitting on the kneeler. <laughs> yes. It does. It doesn't get better than that. It really just doesn't get better. I mean, it's that that 
that's really gold, that stuff. So um, I would watch that stuff at the side of the stage and just, it's just unbelievably funny. Um, yeah, it's, it's good. And it's good training because, you know, uh-huh. those actors um, on Seinfeld, um, they're really committed to the reality of what they're doing. I mean, even, you know, you know, Michael Richards is doing such broad work, but very committed to the reality. It wouldn't be funny if you weren't. And, mm-hmm. um, and it's really, really, really great training. Um, because if you don't make things feel lived in in a sitcom, it's not funny. You have to, you know, you have to make things feel real. There has to be um, a familiarity. Otherwise, a comedy isn't, you can't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, mm. um, so it's great. It was great getting to watch those, those guys work. And plus, I got to go to, like, the season that, um, you know, when you're, when you're part of a show, and particularly back in those days, being in a huge show like Seinfeld, the, the rap parties were always off the hook and they rented for the rap party that year they rented the entire Santa Monica Pier and so it was shut down for everybody but the side fell past and crew from that year and you know we rode on the rides and yeah. food everywhere and there was a raffle and I remember I won a barbecue at the raffle hilarious <laughs> um, yeah Anyway, I've always had good luck winning raffles. But yeah, I was like, they're like, and the 25 year old who has no house has won the barbecue. You know, it was. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. How do you uh, get cast in Wag the Dog? I was. I made a short tape for that. And um, I remember just like wearing a sweater and carrying a clipboard and made a tape for it. And uh, Barry saw it and liked it. I think that's the closest to how I grew up. I mean, that that world of like the Washington intern world, that not, wasn't a big stretch for me. I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. I was very preppy kid mm-hmm. in school. I was very much of a, the kind of kid who could have gone off to do something a little bit more like that. Yeah. Um, and so I think... Um, Barry identified me immediately as being right for the part. Like, it wasn't a stretch to imagine me doing that. And, um, yeah, that was a great set to work on. I mean, talk about the gifts of all time, right? Yeah. It was Barry Levinson. Getting that, that, shooting that whole movie in like 28 days, 27 days out of the, unbelievable, unbelievable. And you knew when you were on the set, you were like, this is going to be one of those movies that... Mm changes things this is one of those movies you just knew it it's just too brilliant yeah oh so good yeah and of really course good. you got the wonderful Anne Heach who's no longer with us and I had worked with you know I I'd worked with her um on that and then I would see her just you know often at at uh you know paths crossed a lot she was mm-hmm. she's a remarkably talented woman who yeah, it's very, it's devastating, and she she was really, um, she was amazing on camera and off, a lovely person. Yeah, very sad. So. Very sad. Uh, Wilbur Falls is a good movie. How was that experience? Well, Danny Hale is crazy. So there's a crossover there because of Lost Law and Order, right? Because mm-hmm. he had done Law and Order for a while, so Chris knew him from that. Chris knows, and... Um, and Danny was just like I. You know, Danny was one of those guys who's always like singing Italian opera in his dressing room kind of guy. Um, and Wilbur Falls is, was just it was a very it was a low budget movie, um, but everybody had a very good attitude about it. And I, I don't you know I don't remember much. I'll be honest, but um, but he was one of those guys who even though, you know, we're doing the turnaround and he'd sit there and still do it. You know, some people, when you get somebody with a name doing an independent movie, they might say like, listen, I'm not going to do the turnaround or whatever. I'm going to go back to my dressing room. I'm tired. But Danny would do it. He's just a first rate guy <laughs> um, and hilarious. But literally you'd be like, oh, Danny's here because, you, you know, that was true on Law & Order too. He's, he's always like singing Italian opera. He's like one of those people always in a good mood and singing, singing, singing. S- Sally Kirkland, I had her on last year. Such a special, fun lady. I, r- I really like oh, her. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, they really got the cool people on it. Was, yes, I like Kirkland, but that hair and that whole vibe. And she's so, yeah, she's fabulous. Going back to uh, Two Girls, A Guy at a Pizza Place, um, you know, I, I, I really liked that show. I thought it was hilarious. Do, do, do you think, though, it didn't go as long as it should have because people just thought of it as, like, another Friends? No, that was not. I mean, people knew. I mean, yes, there were. It, there, it was like Friends, but it really wasn't, too. It was much yeah. more like, I mean, we did those, like, Halloween episodes with, like, people with heads growing. I mean, you know, it was a much more, we did a silent episode. And they were doing some very, very weird, interesting things. It was much broader, in a sense. Um, it did have some similarities to, to Friends. There's no doubt about it. And I'm sure that they were trying to capitalize on the, the market share for that. But the reason it didn't go had nothing to do with that. Um, the reason it didn't go was there was just there was a, a, a huge contractual problem going on with 20th Century Fox and Dharma and Greg. And we were all sort of wrapped up together. And so when the fight happened, um, when, the, when the fight happened with Dharma and Greg, I think the uh, the the fallout was that two guys and a girl got kicked off too. Mm. And my understanding is I think there was some I I can't imagine they ended up being happy that they got rid of that show later because first yeah. of all, look at the cast. Yeah. And um, and they knew it at the time. I know Ryan wasn't Ryan then, but they knew it already. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew Ryan's value. It was not like, oh, and then he became Ryan Reynolds. People, they knew it when they cast him as a lead in that show. They were not unaware. It was not hidden. Every single bit of skill he has later, he had then. That was him every day on set. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Nathan Fillion uh, always was Nathan Fillion. I mean, like, he was going to go on to have a career. He's also one of the nicest people to work with around. So it's like, no surprise there. You know, that's an example of be good to people and you're going to keep working. Nathan knows every single person's name on the crew. Oh. A coffee cart. He's polishing your glasses for you. He's remembering what you like to drink. I mean, Nathan's just that guy. Oh. Ryan, they're Canadian and you feel it on them. They're so incredibly nice to work mm. with. They're so, you know, they don't lose their temper. They don't um, criticize. You never hear them. Even when he was young, you wouldn't hear Ryan complaining. Um, so I think, you know, there is definitely the cream will rise um, motto is just absolutely true. Yeah, we had great directors that we worked with. We had kind of incredible scripts. I loved the writers on that show. Um, you know, was it, was it, Seinfeld? No, it wasn't Seinfeld, but it was damn good, and we have a fan base that is rabid for it, and I, I bet they regretted not renewing it, but it definitely got caught up in this weird politics contract thing with 20th Century Fox and ABC, mm -hmm. and, you know, the numbers that we got when we got canceled, <laughs> people would cry for those numbers today, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My friend, yeah, my are, friend. People are getting people are getting shows on the air, getting like you know, a hundred thousand viewers. You know, we have millions. So my, yeah. My my friend Terry Bola was Julian Box stand in on that show. Terry made a career out of standing in for both little girls and short girls on sitcoms back in the day. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Do you have any favorite episodes? Um. You know, I I I love the one. Um, I mean, there were a lot that I loved. I loved the one where I I'm, I, I got to work with Nathan um, doing because I was doing the plumbing. I was I was like, I'm not going to pay a plumber, and so I had this Ashley had such a kind of snotty attitude about because um, you know, she's an academic and an intellectual, and so her attitude that Nathan is kind of um, that Johnny's kind of an idiot. Mm -hmm. Anyone can be a plumber. And then she tries to to fix her um, her she tries to install or fix her um, her, uh, her her what do you call it the thing in the drain the, that processes food you know and what do you call it, the waste disposal in the drain yeah. that episode to me it let me do physical comedy because I'm doing all this stuff at the drain and then it also let me have this back and forth with 
um, Nathan, which I really, really, um, which I really, really enjoyed. But there was another one that I really liked too, where I was torturing Rich, um, <laughs> and I, I just loved working with Rich because he and I were just would fight, and then of course they ended up having us like start sleeping together. But um, but there was one where I was like ripping off his bandages, and I remember I just I loved that. <laughs> But we got to do all these, like, crazy things. There was one, like, episode where Trailer and I, who our characters never really could vibe together, mm -hmm. the one where we kind of become friends. And in the background of it, you know, they had um, that band, the, those fabulous guys who went on to become just huge. You know, we had all these bands on the, the show because um, we had Blink, Blink, uh -huh. you know, whatever blink whatever that band is they were oh, blink 182 right and then we had the um what's the name of the band that did the one with me in trailer it's like um um i'm not familiar with not, that one the canadian band oh my god they're huge they're they're um um oh my god i'm being a total idiot this is always my nightmare that i can't remember smash mouth who, but uh no did those they're they're a great band. I think they're Canadian. Um and uh anyway, it narrated. They like they would pop up behind the um um they would pop up from behind the couch like every time we would have a scene together and start singing mm -hmm. the narrative, the subtext of what we were doing. And um it, friends was not doing stuff like that. I mean we were doing really weird stuff. Bare naked ladies. Bare oh, bare naked ladies, yes. The guys who do one week. I literally got to work. Like, that was one of my greatest experiences. Like, fucking bare naked ladies came on the show and was the soundtrack for our scene. Yeah. So when people say, like, oh, you know, was it a Friends ripoff? I was like, Friends wasn't doing stuff like that. We were doing, like, weird avant-garde stuff. Like, it was very weird. The show was, like, fun but it always had a sense of almost being surreal mm -hmm. um, and uh, it had very smart guys working on it um, anyway so yeah it was it was a it was a great experience and you know just being in the, the makeup room together on that mm. lot um, you know, it was this little makeup room and Ryan was just really funny man he's a really funny guy um, yeah, my favorite. A lot. <laughs> yeah. My my favorite episode. There's this one where the one where um, you get arrested and then you're in court. James Avery is the judge, and oh, yeah. the cop. Yeah, the cop stopped you. You two, and she's telling you to unbutton your blouse, and you're just you're saying so many. Th uh, you're making so many wisecracks to him. Like I'm surprised he didn't arrest you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was really fun. I remember when they told me, you're going to love the next episode, Suzanne. They're like, you, Ashley goes to, she gets arrested and she's in jail. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, it was great when they would put us in these situations that just don't work for our characters. Like, Ashley's yeah. not going to be somebody who could um, get who could get arrested. I, I, I actually called one of the showrunners uh, last year. I was like, you guys should just do... A Halloween episode. Ryan loves the show. Nathan loves the show. I love the show. I, we all love the show, and I we'd all do it. I think. And I was like, we could shoot it in like four days, mm -hmm. and and you don't have to have any reality for it. You know, you you just have and and you don't do a regular show, but you like do one for Halloween. Like the fans, I I think they'd get insane numbers if they did uh, an ABC special, thirty minute Halloween special. Um, yeah. Like they bring them all back, you know, and 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 just because you don't have to have any reality. Our Halloween specials were just bonkers, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I do I you know if Ryan was free, I I think Ryan would do it. I was you know I was on a couple shows at the time, um, and I was like, if I'm free, you know, I'll I would a hundred percent come do it. So anyway, maybe you never know. Maybe they'd still do it. And yeah. Have to, it's it's just funny. We're all a lot older, but it would really be. <clears throat> yeah, there should be a reboot for sure. Just yeah, just one, just something insane, not like real. Nobody wants to see like the drama. Of just something insane where we're fighting ghosts or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how much I love Friends and Lovers. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's very popular amongst the swinger community. 
Now, that is hilarious. Um, I didn't know that because I do wonder, you know, I, none of us ever made any money from that movie mm-hmm. um, because the profits were hidden from everyone, including the director, who's still one of my best friends and was here only last night for dinner. Wow. Last night at my house, George Haas was here. Um, very, very close family friend. He, he spends most holidays with us. He's no longer a film director. He's one of the foremost meditation teachers in Los Angeles and around. I mean, he's, he's, he's this big guru guy. He's always done many things. He's an incredible photographer and an artist. And wow. One of the things he did was write and do some movies for a while, but that's kind of not even ever been his main thing. Um, an incredible group of people, a fairly stupid script, I'm going to be honest. I don't yeah. think George would, 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 would kick me for saying that. Um, I love stupid. You know, <laughs> with George Newbern and Claudia Schiffer and, and Allison Eastwood and Neil Barry and Robert Downey Jr. and, and, and Leon. It was just like, it, and Danny Nucci, who I worked with again later when I did The Foster. I know Paula, his wife. Oh, and I've known Paula for years. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, George Newbern. Oh my God, the sweetest guy. I met him at a convention, and you know, we, I just wanted his a picture with him. I didn't want to get an autograph, right? Normally, when you meet uh, celebrities at conventions, right, they're not very conversational or nice when you just want a picture with them. But he actually made the point to have a little conversation with me and my mom beforehand. I thought that was so sweet. He is one of the nicest people in the world. He is absolutely 100% one of the nicest people in the world. And he's very, very funny, which not everybody realizes, but he's a very funny guy. Yeah, I loved working with George Newbarn. He, we had a funny story. Um, it was snowy. We were filming in Utah. Mm-hmm. And he had, he was a boy, and so he had brought video games with him. Yeah. And I went to hang out in his room. We were just, like, bored at the beginning of filming. We didn't even really know each other yet. And he's like, do you want to play, like, a video game? You know, so we're hanging out in his room. And he was teaching me how to play, like, some shooter game, which I sucked at. Just because I, I don't know how to play video games. So he was teaching me. And um, I went, oh, my God, like, when I was about to die. And I blew my, threw my arms back. Mm-hmm. and hit him in the eye with my elbow. For the rest of the frickin' movie, George Newbern has, like, a black eye for, like, the next two weeks so they have to cover him up with pancake makeup because George had a black eye because of me. Like, the day before we started filming. Really bad black eye. So that was pretty funny. Um, yeah. All from me <laughs> trying to do... I And I never played the shooter game again. I was like, that's it. I'm out. Like, I'm out. I've wounded my castmate. I you know, died within two seconds of whatever game it was. I was like, I know, yeah, yeah, but yeah. So George Newbern, if you look carefully, has a black eye in that movie. Or at least for much, for much of it. You're, uh, you're pregnant in the movie. Like, was that a padded belly? Yeah, yeah. I was, I hadn't, I was not married yet at that point. That was, hmm. um, we tried to get one that was as real looking as we, uh, as we could get. And, uh, and yeah, the costume fittings were hard because she had to be really pregnant. So yeah. Did it, did, um, did it have a belly button? Yeah, I think it did. But you know, damn, damned if I remember. It's been a while now, so. Yeah, I, I know an actress back in the '70s. She did a movie where she had to be pregnant, and uh, she took that 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 padded belly with her everywhere for for years to get special treatment <laughs> on airplanes and and stuff, and you know, um, assisted seating and stuff. I was like, "You are so evil!" And she's the nicest lady in the world. <laughs> that is really that's really bad. That's like that's like pretending to have a wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I get, I'm one of those people that yell at people when I see them parking in handicap spaces. I'm like, D- don't you even, because there, I have too many friends that have serious handicaps that need those spaces. I'm like, friends who are in wheelchairs that they must be in that space, and senior parents who need those spaces. When I see these ladies in their SUVs rolling into CVS and grabbing it, because they, I'm like, oh, I, I just want to give them a to the moon, Alice, is what I want to do when I see those ladies <laughs> or men. Anyway, yeah. were, were you were you comfortable uh, doing the boob shot in the movie? Uh, you know, I just not. I don't. You know, that's yeah. Who cares? That's that's a big. That's the big. Yeah. You know, whatever. D- don't care about that. So can you can, can you imagine the amount of intimacy coordinators that would be on this set now? 
Yeah, you know? no, it's true. I mean, we had to have Oscar Nunez and I had to have intimacy coordinators all over straight man and stuff like that. It's, uh, you know, there's definitely pluses about that mm-hmm. um, because not everybody is, um, you just have to be, you just, it, there's definitely pluses about it. So um, uh, for some people, maybe it, Oscar and I were like, uh, guys, we're doing a comedy here and there's no actual body showing it. We don't really need an intimacy coordinator. Mm-hmm. But, um, but there's times on set, particularly with younger younger people, um, where I think it's really important. And, um, you know, I've been in sets before where I'm supposed to be doing love scenes. And I said, you know, it's like a low-budget movie. And I'm like, you 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 can't, it's not my job to choreograph this. And it, you do understand this is a dance. This is not improv, right? This is not, we're not doing a love scene. This is about getting shot of a dance that makes it look what you, how you want it to look on camera. And so having an intimacy coordinator makes sure that the director and the producers um, aren't asking actors to do things that push yeah. it into a different kind of film, let's put it that way, because that would not be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, you were all free-spirited, not easily offended, like-minded professional actors who signed up for this body comedy. Yeah. So nobody really, no, I don't think it, it, it was a very chill, it was a very chill group of people. But yeah, you're right. It would be different now. And that's, that's probably a good thing. So, you, know. you, you guest starred on the King of Queens. Was that fun? Well, you know, it's funny. I had never watched that show and uh, I didn't really know. I mean, it's a huge franchise. I had auditioned for her role when it came out oh it was taken around los angeles so that was i remember auditioning for that pilot and i i remember thinking yeah i'm not going to be getting this pilot i mean i'm about as you know i'm like a girl from greenwich i'm not going to be playing that part it's just you know i was not good in my audition and rightfully didn't get it so i was familiar with what it was because i had auditioned for the pilot um i was very pregnant when I did that show. I think I was about six months pregnant Mm -hmm. and had told my agent, yeah, I'll audition for this, but you got to tell them I'm pregnant because I'm not going to hide this baby. And um, they didn't tell them. And Mm -hmm. I got cast. And then I showed up and said, I'm like, I'm six months pregnant. Now, I knew the costume designer, so it was fine. Like, she works with me and everything, but like, I'm wearing raincoats and all that stuff in there. I'm very big. Um, but uh, but when I was on set, like my jaw hit the floor. <laughs> I just didn't know. He's she's a genius. Yeah, yeah. She's unbelievable. But he's you know he is he's you know he's like Kelsey Grammer and, and Jerry Seinfeld. I mean he's a genius. And watching him on set, I was like, oh my god! I had no, I just didn't know. I wasn't familiar with him. So yeah, it was it was that was fun to go on there when I had sort of stopped working for a while because I was pregnant. So to get to do kind of one more job and watch two people who really, really, first of all, really comfortable with each other, really adore each other, and um, um, he, um, and and Leah and 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 Kevin just just watching them work together was just it was amazing. Um, so it's not like I thought it was like the greatest show ever to hit the you know, with our episode, I mean, specifically. Yeah. I was like, it, it seems funny to me, but, um, I, I would have casted you as Carrie. I think you would have done a great job. Oh God. No, I just, you know, I've never gotten those like Italian, y sort of, you know, or I've never, like people don't buy me as that. I mean, I, I think, um, people just, she, I can't even think of anyone else who would be as good as her now. I mean, she's so good at that stuff. She's really skilled. She was, really but fun. I think you, yeah. you would have been as good as well, you know. Well, that's very that's very kind of you. I think we all fall into the stuff that we're supposed to fall into, you know what I mean? We end up doing, like, what's right. I agree. So, uh, I agree. So you you joined Silicon Valley in the second season, right? Uh, yes, I did, and um, and that was the real gift, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Bay Area guy. I was I was actually in the background of the pilot somewhere. I like it was like a, a an extras casting call. And I saw on Craigslist. I just showed up in the background over there in Palo Alto. Um, did you enjoy doing the show? 
Yes, very much so. It was a wonderful set. Those guys are real professionals. Um, just uh, every single one of them on that set is... Uh, uh, it was an incredible work ethic, incredible comedy, um, getting to work with Alec Berg and Mike Judge um, and that staff of writers. You don't, you don't have people... Uh, listen, everybody's smart. Their consultants are all like from MIT and Cal, you know they're they're literally like having people from Caltech and MIT and, and Stanford consult on the show, and um, it's just that level of um, uh, sophistication in terms of like yes we were doing crazy drug raunchy whatever stuff too, but the the the, the mind behind it, the kind of the generating mind behind it was just incredible and it was so coherent and the way the first episode tied to the last episode it's i think it's one of the most complete um sitcoms i've ever seen the fact that it never won best sitcom is a crime yeah it really is absolutely a crime because it's one of the best things i don't care that i was on it like i know when i do something that's really great when i'm not that shows one of the best shows ever made yeah, and it's it's amazing how Mike Judge has gone from being the adult animation guy to satirizing the corporate world, live action. I just I never would have, you know, expected that evolvement in his career. I mean, it started with Office Space, and then it just you know kept going from there. Well, he and Alec are just they're insanely, insanely smart. Hmm. It's, this is no like oh wow what a surprise that they created something smart. Like these two guys are insanely smart and tech background. So they're like, these guys, they're really, and they're quiet, but then when they say something, they're just incredible. So yeah, I mean, it, and in any case, it doesn't matter. Like everybody knows that show's great and the guys mm-hmm. on it, Zach, just one of the best improvers in the building, Thomas Middleditch, just unbelie- unbelievably difficult job he had. He's extraordinary improver, extraordinary physical comedy. TJ, just unbelievable you know, the way he could spin stuff and just go on for 20 minutes doing stuff. Uh, unbelievable, <laughs> pain brain. Martin, such a brilliant actor. Kumail, I mean, just Kumail and Martin. I mean, these guys, like, you getting a cast like this, these people, unbelievable. And then I got to work with Amanda, and Amanda just really, mm-hmm. people don't realize how much she brought to the show. She's a wonderful actress, and she just, absolutely kind of grounded that show in so many ways. Very difficult job because she had to sort of lay the pipe for a lot of things and just kind of keep it on track. But um, Stephen yeah. Tobolowski, who, of course, is a legendary genius. Yeah, so he came on whatever in season, whenever, mm-hmm. and he was on for a year, a year and a half, um, and Stephen's just so... I mean, there were so many, so many people. Yeah, it's an incredible show. Incredible show. Uh, I'm a huge Beavis and Butthead fan. You recently did voices for the reboot series. Did, did yeah, I've been doing. <laughs> yeah, I, they bring me on every once in a while to do little stuff, and it's really fun. They just want like kind of real sounding people, kind of doing the voices. So it's not like doing the kind of work you do on The Simpsons. It's very yeah. much like Mike does the crazy work, and then everybody around him sort of just does sort of people. But it's so much fun because first of all, I get to have some proximity still to Mike, and uh, and I also know. Um, his his partner um, Lou, who's married to Daisy Gardner, who's one of the writers in Silicon Valley, and Daisy Gardner, I also work with in the school system. So it's a small, small, small world. It is. It is. So you got anything coming up? Um, well, I'm still in Percy Jackson, and we just got renewed yesterday. So, um, um, and unfortunately, Lucky Hank with Bob Odenkirk won't be. But it ended up being a kind of a nice little season. It's sort of like short. In a sense, we did the book. We all really, really wanted to do a season two, and mm-hmm. we're disappointed that AMC didn't pick us up. But I think it was probably the wrong network for the show. We were really kind of a an academic show mm-hmm. on a network that does a lot of zombies. So. Um, uh, that was a shame and a great experience, but I'm on Percy Jackson playing uh, the mother of monsters. So yeah, I'll be doing that. And then, you know, we'll see what else things are just getting going again now. So post strike. So we'll see. We'll see. And you just did a movie called pools. Yeah, I did. I filmed that actually about two years ago, I think now. Okay. Um, yeah, but that was with Odessa, um, who's Pamela Adlin's daughter. She's amazing. Totally different kind of actress than um, actors I've worked with before. She's very much of that um, 
she's extraordinary. She's sort of in her body, in the moment, not worried about doing makeup on set. Gorgeous, just present. And the first time I started working with her, and she just comes up and hugs you. She's very, very warm and wacky and interesting. And I thought, oh, my God, Suzanne, you have to really make sure when you're working with this young powerhouse that you keep it. You know, I was doing a very arch comic role. Mm-hmm. had a specific purpose in the thing. But I was like, you can't get fakey, fakey, because Odessa is so real. If you get fakey, fakey, you're going to seem like you're doing something like horrible, horrible sitcom from, you know, so real. Or late 70s, and you just, you don't want to seem that way when you're acting with her. So I tried to like split the difference between doing the the silly mean stuff they needed me to do and trying to like. But anyway, yeah, hopefully it's a it's definitely a young person's like it's a young person's movie. It's got that whole aesthetic mm. and thought that is a little bit foreign to me in my 50s. Um, but it's really weird and cool and very talented young people in it. So. Awesome. I'll keep an eye out for that one. So real quick, we got to play by Secret Silly Game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. It's no win or lose. It's just pure fun. And how the game works, Suzanne, is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. And feel free to comment on the answers, because they might be funny. Okay, here we go. Suzanne, are you ticklish? Not anymore. <laughs> I was horrifically ticklish before. Are you ticklish? Yes, but if you tickle me without warning, though, I might hit you in the groin. Yeah, well, that's, then no one wants that. Yeah, I used to be so ticklish, and I'm really not ticklish anymore, and I don't know how that goes away, but isn't that crazy? Yeah, I would, my mother would even make tickling fingers at me, and I would start crying. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> it was paralyzing my left was tickling. Traumatic. <laughs> next one. Is your belly button an in or an Audi? They're all going this direction. <laughs> what? Was that offensive? <laughs> no, I just don't like the direction it's going because that's not the kind of interview I do. It's, oh no, 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 no! It's it's gonna long. it's gonna it's gonna go more and more innocuous. Okay. Just so long as we don't. And and do you have an innie or an outie? I think all my kids have innies, actually. I have an innie. Yeah, I think it's very rare to have an outie. Okay. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Not painted right now. Oh. a lazy mom. I hope yours aren't. Do you paint your toenails? I do. Uh, right now they're not painted. Last time they were, they were uh, gold with sparkles. Yeah, when I do, I usually do gold with sparkles too. Like when I have an event, they'll match every shoe. But mm-hmm. I just don't, I just, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with that stuff. Uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? Uh, I think I'm honest. I would say that would be, uh, 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 I'm, I think I'm direct. I'm very direct. You are very I direct. I don't hold things inside, and so then I don't, I'm not, I never wake up the next day mad, because I just say the stuff I have to say in the moment, so I, I don't hold on to grudges and stuff like that. Um, how about you? What's your best personality trait? I have empathy and no filter. Yes, yes, I, I agree, I see that, yeah. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> and then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? You know, the funny thing is it's not skunk because I had a pet skunk when I was little. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that, uh, I'm trying to think because I feel like there probably is. And I'm, wow. Most people, a lot of people, we have a lot of skunks where I live, but I, yeah. I, I don't mind them because I had a baby skunk for an entire summer and it sprayed me all the time. So I'm like, yeah, that's. That smell just doesn't bother me at all. I mean, when the refrigerator gets dirty and there's rotting vegetables in there, I really, really, the compost, like that smell, I really, that, I can barely, we, I'm like, then I make my husband run out to get rid of the compost because that will make me gag. So that's my answer. How about you? Uh, either farts or feet. Yeah. It's, 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 they don't bother me too much, but I try and keep away from them. You know, and when you have three kids and you're driving them in the minivan, everybody's farting all the time, so you kind of get used to that, too. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. that's what everyone tells me. I compost, I can't, I can't, I can't get used to compost, so. <laughs> Suzanne, you are a national treasure. This has been a dream. Thank you for finally coming on today. See, I was harmless and fun. <laughs> all right, thanks.
thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And thanks for bringing back so many memories because I always think I don't have any stories, but it is interesting that your mind, when you unlock certain things, you remember other things. So it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you got great stories. You know, you should do. You should uh, talk more often. I think you you are very articulate. Oh, sure. It's enough. There's all the young people are more interesting now. So, um, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, and I really appreciate it. So, have a great rest of your day, and hopefully, not too much more rain here. Yes, have a great rest of your day. Enjoy the sun. Be safe, and see you on social media. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Suzanne Cryer, ain't she a sweetheart? Ah, I love her. She is bold, honest, direct, and she is fun. And I enjoyed talking to her today. She was awesome. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes! <laughs>